everybody, this is Thomas Stünkel, founder of CommissioningCoach.com, a commissioning engineer, commissioning manager and commissioning coach. Welcome to this training session about air blowing. My special guest today is Jim Winston and I will hand over now to Jim. Hello, Jim. Hello, Mr. Thomas. How are you? Fine. How is it in California? I'm here in the cold Slovakia today. Oh, it's very warm and sunny. Beautiful. It's paradise here. <laughs> Great. Okay, today you will give a presentation about air blowing. Yes, I will. Okay. Great. Then I would say let's start with this presentation. Thank you very much, Thomas. I'm delighted to start. Hello and welcome to Basic Modern Commissioning. This session on equipment cleaning services is brought to you by Jim Vinson, owner of Vinson Consulting Group since 2008, now located in California, USA. I've lived and worked in commissioning and pre-commissioning in the Middle East for many years from 1981 until 2014 when I returned to the USA. My experience extends from 1973 up to today, which is over 40 years of experience. I worked in the USA initially, then Saudi Arabia, Western Europe, and then back to the Middle East in the mid-1990s. I'm still active today, providing technical consulting and engineering, and also project management services. This includes commissioning and pre-commissioning projects, mostly in heavy industries such as petrochemicals, electric power plants, refineries, fertilizer and ammonia plants, methanol and NGL plants, and various types of hydrocarbon separation plants. Please check my profile on LinkedIn. VCG services clients worldwide to assist them in planning and managing their projects, sometimes remotely and sometimes on site. I have seen and solved many problems in my years of experience, and I think I can share some valuable solutions with you that may help you with your current job. Let's look at some basic cleaning methods for modern industries and assist you to understand how to choose the right ones for your problems. Also, I have included some advanced topics which will be useful to you for planning and performing the methods, executing the job, getting good results, and working safely. VCG offers training and instructional services in the form of instructional packages, as shown here in these five basic training packages on basic cleaning methods. Air blowing is the cheapest and quickest, but not always the best. These methods are arranged in the order of increasing cleaning levels produced. So, air blowing is the lowest, chemical cleaning is the highest. Steam blowing and chemical cleaning give the highest levels of cleaning but are more complicated and more expensive. So these are the basic or beginning topics and there are also other more advanced training topics available to VCG as well, such as project management, contract management, operations management, commercial and technical bidding practices, planning and estimation, job calculations, job risk analysis, creation of technical method statements for clients, and other related topics are offered. In presenting these topics, I am assuming that you, the viewer, or the attendee, are either already working in this area, or that you have some knowledge of the basic essentials of this subject, and you have some level of interest. If this is not the case, please contact me and I will either try to adjust the presentation or point you to other higher or lower levels of presentations on these topics. In order for you to get a benefit that will help you in your job, think of a problem job you were on in the past. Summarize the job, describe the problem, plus tell how you solved the problem, or tell me if you could not solve the problem. Write your summary and send it to me via email. I will analyze your problem job and will suggest some possible solutions and explanations so that you and others also can benefit from lessons you learned on your problem job. No need to give the job name or exact city or plant location, but the date of the job would be nice to know. I will, I will remind you about this again at the end of the session. All right, let's look at some of the learning goals that I have for air blowing, things I would like for you to come away with. We'll take a quick look at the basic features and the benefits. 
I'll tell you why you should air blow, why it's good to choose air for certain types of jobs, when not to choose air blow. I will tell you briefly, technically, what is air blowing, and I will tell you how to air blow. So in this instructional topic, you will learn these facts about air blowing services that will support these six learning goals listed on this slide. Question number one, why air blow? Air blowing is one of the cheapest, most simple, and quickest cleaning methods. But the downside, or the negative side, is that it removes the least amount of dirt and debris of any of the methods discussed here in these VCG training packages. Thus, the cleaning results are the lowest of the five. Why choose air? Air, or air blows, physically move the loose and the lightweight debris out of piping systems, tanks, and heat exchangers, but cannot remove dense, larger debris or scales that are stuck too tightly to the ID, nor chemically bonded to the surfaces, such as scales. So to get more cleaning with air blowing, you have to use higher pressures, larger volumes, and longer durations of air blows on each piping segment to keep the velocity at its exit point as high as possible. So, first general rule, you blow into the larger ID piping and the exit into and out of the smaller ID piping to keep the velocity at the exit point as high as possible. This gives you the best cleaning possible. And you also move systematically to the next blow and don't contaminate earlier clean piping. So you have to have a system. You have to design a series of blows and move from one to the other. To successfully clean large systems using air blowing, one has to separate the total system into many smaller segments, hopefully with shorter and straighter lengths, in order to keep the air velocity as high as possible. Since air has a very low density, and the velocity and time are really the only variables you can control, you cannot change the density of air very much, as cooling it is not much of a benefit compared to the cost of the cooling. Let's go ahead to slide number seven quickly, and we'll come back. Take a look at this density table taken from engineeringtoolbox.com. Look at the yellow lines, the temperatures marked as 0, 50, 100, and 400 degrees Celsius. And I direct your attention to the zero line first, and if you examine this line, you see that moving from this line to the next yellow line, the density of air varies from about 1.3 down to 1.1. Now this density is expressed in kilograms per cubic meter. So over this 50 degree range of temperature, you have a decrease, a decline in the density. And you realize, with a little bit of scientific knowledge, that as you heat any gas, the density is going to come down. Now, from 50 degrees C up to 100 degrees C, the density varies from 1.1 down to 0.95. As you get into steam temperatures, the density varies from about 0.95 on down to 0.5. Now, you don't want to memorize this table. No one would. So if you can remember these three values and the temperatures, you can pretty much summarize that table and use it to be a useful comparison while you're thinking about airborne. So 1.3 at 0 degrees, 1.1 at 50. 0.95 at 100, and 0.52 at 400 degrees C. So you can see the pattern and understand why the density trend goes down and know how it might affect the cleaning results of air blowing. So just to summarize this briefly, the inertia of air at 0 degrees C is about 20% more than 50 degrees C. The inertia of air at 100 degrees is about 20% less than it is at 50 degrees C. The inertia of air at 400 degrees C is about 50% less than it is at 50 degrees C. So keep that in mind and you will have a handy point of reference. Let's go back to slide number 6 quickly or briefly. For complicated piping geometries, it is necessary and you should have a plan or make a plan of for breaking down piping segments into smaller and straighter systems. 
This is much better than flushing the whole system in one blow. And the reason is because the flow velocities can be higher. And remember, higher flow velocities give greater cleaning results. Any given blow segment contains some differences in ID of the piping, but the diameter should not vary greatly. I recommend not more than 50% or so. So the practical interpretation of this would be that it's okay to, to, to group 2 and 3 inch pipe with 6 inch and 6 inch pipe with 8 inch, but I would not group 2 or 3 inch with 12 inch or 14, and I would not group 6 inch pipe with 12 or 14 inch pipe. Now, if you're going to do an air blow, obviously you need an air compressor. You can use either a temporary auxiliary air compressor, or you might be lucky and the system would be up and running in the plant, so you can use a system compressed air for the air blowing. Now, there's not much quantitative measurement you can do about the air blowing, but white paper targets can be used to verify the type of debris removed if the client requests. So you can observe the cleaning, cleaning trends, but otherwise, very little quantification of the amount of debris is possible with air blowing. It's very difficult to quantify the amount of kilos that you remove. Also, usually if you use oil-free dry air, dry meaning not containing water or humidity, the system does not need to be dried and preserved after the air blowing is finished to avoid the rusting of the ID metal surfaces. But the system should be sealed off or reconnected and reinstated or boxed up as soon as possible. Now for higher cleaning levels, remember, use water which can dissolve certain fouling materials, take them into solution, and it can be easily drained out at the end of the process. Chemical additives can also be included to make this even more effective than air blowing, which is, remember, a simply a physical cleaning method, not a chemical cleaning method. I'll give you just a brief preview of the next topic, give you a tip about water flushing. Moving water has a higher force of inertia, and remember inertia is mass times velocity. Moving water has higher force of inertia due to its higher specific gravity as compared with air, so it can physically remove much heavier debris than air. This makes it much more effective at debris, debris removal than air is. Water flushing typically gives a cleaner system than air blowing alone, and sometimes the two methods are even combined in sequence to give even better cleaning. All right, let's skip ahead two slides now. We've already looked at the density table, and you remember your comparisons and the percentages at various temperatures. Air blowing features and benefits. Advanced topic details for air blowing services. Features and benefits we've already gone over. Air blowing is quicker, not cleaner, but it is quicker. It's useful when you have light density, dust, sand, dirt, and debris. It's not useful when you have heavier debris or tightly adhering scale or fouling material. It's not useful for paint, preservatives, varnish, lacquer, if you have oils and greases. No, it is not useful in these instances. So how do you do an air blow? Well, an air blow, first of all, should start with an engineering planning section. And you should know, is an air blow the most efficient way to go? Which means you need to compare the, the benefits to the costs. The features and the benefits always have to be compared to the cost. What is the cost? How long does the cleaning take? How do you calculate this? How do you evaluate? How do you decide? Well, if you want to know how to estimate the cost of air blowing, you have to identify all the individual cost items in the job and find or estimate if you cannot find the unit cost of every item, you must estimate. Hopefully, you will make a good estimate. If you do not, you will either make not very much profit, or you'll make so much profit that you don't get invited back for the next job. So either one is bad. So, then you calculate the amount or the quantity of every item that you use, multiply the quantity times the cost per amount, and this will give you the estimated cost for the job. 
Now, when you think about cost items, remember, both time and materials each have costs associated, as well as personnel and planning and engineering and execution. So make sure you include everything. The benefits of planning and estimating include savings from the lower cost of materials and labor and the fact that you have cleaner systems delivered quicker. Another big PR benefit is the increased client satisfaction, which will ultimately give you repeat work. And repeat work means higher profits. Again, do not use air blowing if you're blowing from small diameter lines into larger diameter lines. Why? The velocity becomes very low and produces little or no cleaning results. Example, do not blow into lines that exit into large tanks, or knockout drum, or vessels, or larger lines. Remember, water flushing along with certain required chemical additives will remove more material than when air blowing. So you must examine the PNIDs and the PFDs to create short blow length and simple straight through geometries in the air blow that you create. This if you can do this, is a very good choice, a very cheap choice, but again, it's not quite as clean as some of the other methods. Now, you can combine as many pieces of piping and plant equipment as is practical, but then you must calculate the exit velocities at the air pressures available to you to make sure that it is not too low to properly clean the equipment. Again, do not attempt to use air to remove paint, protective coatings, light scale, tight scales, or large size dense debris. Airborne will not remove these items. So again, to give a brief, a brief summary of the features and benefits is that airborne is useful to either eliminate or reduce the debris in dirty pipes, reduce contamination to give a higher purity product when you start up plant equipment. It will also eliminate or minimize the damage to rotating equipment, such as pumps, filters, compressors, drainers, and also valve seats. And this saves money. But remember, it removes only loose dirt and debris with little or no damage to the plant equipment. The biggest negative, it's rough cleaning only, and it's not thorough. In order to maximize your benefits and results and minimize your cost, you need to investigate and review several methods to clean each type of equipment and each type of system in your plant facility and consider the suitability of its application, in quotes, for each problem in your plant facility. Now, if you have a good method to clean heat exchangers in one section of the plant, it does not guarantee it's a good way to clean heat exchangers in another section of the plant. It depends upon the service and the materials, air, gas, liquids, or whatever flowing through the heat exchangers. So it's important to make a table to compare the benefits and the cost, and remember that time is always a cost for each cleaning method in order to make the best choice. So you should ask yourself, do you know how to make this table? If you do not, you need to ask questions and find the answers to those questions so that you can do this quickly and efficiently. Some systems do not have to be as clean as others in order to operate properly and efficiently, so you must identify these systems. You must know what the acceptable maximum and minimum contamination limits are for each system in your plant facility. So no need to waste money when it doesn't need to be really clean. Spend the money where it needs to be super clean. You must know your needs exactly. You must know your needs in great detail. If you don't, then you need to include staff members that do. Ask them to sit in with your team to make the best choices and in order not to waste time and money. Okay, air is obviously free. Air compressors and all the other equipment and people are obviously not free. Plan carefully to include all your costs. Do not forget to include any cost items. If you do, you will suffer. For example, don't forget to include the full cost of compressed air, including maintenance, lubrication, filters and hoses, Hoses are a very big, expensive cost item in airborne. And also, sometimes special connections are required. All these must be added to the equipment cost of the air compressor to come up with your total equipment cost. 
Number two, identify or calculate an hourly or a daily cost price. Maybe you're going to buy air compressors, maybe you're going to rent air compressors, but calculate an hourly or daily cost price for all equipment to be used on the job. Maybe you will include air dryers, maybe you will not. Include all costs for this as well. Include any and all costs for outsourcing or hiring subcontractors to provide goods and materials. Also, don't forget to include trucking, cranes, riggers, spotters, and forklifts, and qualified operators. Don't forget those costs. They will bite you, and your profits will go down, down, down. Remember that planning and engineering and estimation hours are not free. How many men and how many hours will it require to complete your job planning? You have to have planners and estimators, and you have to have people who are familiar with the work so that they make proper estimates. What is your true cost per hour for manpower? You have engineers, you have equipment operators, you may have drivers, mechanics, laborers, warehousemen. How do you know you have included every cost for manpower? You need to check with someone in your company and get a true cost for different skill sets. How do you know you have included every cost for materials? Have you planned for sufficient quantities of these materials? Two very important questions you must have the answer for. Always have someone review your estimates and your calculations. Do not assume that you can make the perfect job estimate, especially not on the first time. And my final caution is that you should always use a computer spreadsheet similar to an Excel to construct and total your estimated cost. Spreadsheets do not make mistakes when adding and allocating expenses. Okay, what is airborne good for? We've said that it's good for debris removal. You can dewater with air to a certain extent. If you're going to dewater, obviously you want to have very dry air. If you're going to do pigging, you may have fluids involved first, and then you can switch to air and dry later. You can even do pneumatic pressure testing with air. You can do leak testing with air. Just remember it's temperature sensitive. In order to choose the correct application of cleaning methods and material, you must be thoroughly familiar with the correct type of cleaning that is applicable to your particular specific cleaning problem in your plant on your job. No method, that's in all caps, no method can remove everything in every system and in every situation. There is no universal cleaning method. So don't pick an expensive method that does not or cannot give you the cleaning level you need. Don't waste your money there. Use the cheaper one. For extremely clean requirements, you are forced to use an expensive one. So don't pick an expensive one for the cheap things. One method does not fit all your cleaning problems. Just like one size shoe does not fit all. Okay, cautions would include this. Air blowing will not remove rust or scale, tightly adherent rust or scale. Paint, lacquer, oil, grease, or varnish, anything you can paint on and spray on, it will not remove preservative coatings, such as anti-rust compounds. It will not remove 100% of the water in any piping or piece of equipment without spatial drying equipment. It will not remove large, dense, heavy objects. So you must also completely understand which medium, either air or water, will remove which type of fallow without damaging plant equipment or piping. You must understand plant equipment erosion and corrosion and how to minimize and prevent it. You must understand everything about how to store, seal, and preserve clean equipment and how to keep it protected until time is ready to be commissioned also. Otherwise, you will have lost your cleaning and you'll have to repeat it. So the costs go up by a factor of two, plus your delay cost. Okay, safety cautions. Working with equipment is dangerous. Anytime you get out of bed, you enter a danger area. Air blowing is done with compressed air. Compressing a gas stores energy in the gas. When you have pressurized a gas up to a high pressure, remember that high pressure equals high energy. If you release it quickly, you will have a large expansion. 
large expansion quick normally means large damages. High pressure is danger. Remember, high pressure is danger. So exhaustive blows are dangerous. Whether it's air blow or steam blow, exhaustive blows are dangerous. For safety reasons and for efficiency of cleaning, normally the modern recommendation is you do not do exhaustive blows. You do continuous blows. So you can see that you have to ask yourself this question. You must understand every physical and chemical fact about the time of cleaning media, the type of cleaning media and method that you choose. You must ask yourself this question. Do you know all the physics and chemical factors to consider in this cleaning method? Is it right for your particular problem? How do you know? If you don't know, how do you find out? You need skills in pipe fitting, fabrication, erection, installation and equipment operation such as the safe operation of pumps of various types plus you need supervisory skills in order to guide your team and in order to know how and what methods and materials to choose in addition you need to know everything about working safely during the cleaning and afterwards during the commissioning so it's a lot to think about all right let's say that you have decided air blowing is what you need let's say you're bidding on a job or let's say you're cleaning your own piece of equipment. You need to know all the job costs, either for planning or for bidding. SOW and WBS are two very important terms. You must define these exactly so that there's no ambiguity, there's nothing vague, there's nothing undefined. SOW equals scope of work. WBS is a work breakdown statement. Work breakdown statement, WBS. When you start planning, you're going to create personnel lists. You're going to organize teams. You're going to pick an equipment list. They call it equipment spread. You have to design the best one to do the most work with the least equipment in the smallest space. So you've got to do, you've got to perform planning and engineering. You've got to do a lot of pencil work. Then don't forget to estimate time for each work task activity. There's a lot of information about this available on the net, on the, on the internet. Uh, work breakdown structure templates are available. Look at projectmanagementdocs.com and go to the section of project planning. Here are questions you must ask yourself in order to make accurate job calculations. So you have to come up with the right questions and then you have to find the answers to these right questions. So number one, how do you cal calculate all the job costs accurately? You must identify every item, every cost is going to be put against your project. How do you make sure that you will make enough profit on a job? Even if it's your own job, on your own plan, on your own equipment, you have to consider the cost. How many men and how much equipment do you need to do any given job? Everyone has a different opinion. What is the reality? Have you done this before? Very useful. It's called experience. If you've done it before, you may know that it might take four men and not 40 men. How do you construct a bid and how do you deliver it? If you want to work on someone else's equipment, you must make a profit. This is why I ask you, how do you make sure that you will make enough profit on the job? How do you explain what your bid includes in written format and explain what it does not include? And how are you going to do the work? Can you explain how you constructed your bid? How did you do your calculations? How do you plan properly and engineer correctly? You have to answer this question for yourself. Maybe another question is, what is engineering? The most important question is, how long does it really take to complete a job? From the first time the clock starts till you're finished and you have a signed invoice presented for payment in the process. A lot to think about. If you can't answer all these questions that I've mentioned here and you don't know how to do all these tasks, then you need someone to help you who does know how to do all these tasks correctly, safely, and profitably. Otherwise, you can never make an accurate job cost or bid and then you will lose money. This is always guaranteed. Probably the only thing that's guaranteed. Don't try to do job estimating alone. Even if you are an experienced professional, you need other people's input 
and review. You need to answer the questions, all these questions that I've given you here. A lot to think about. Advanced topics, job calculations. All right, let's get a little more into the details here. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because you may already know this. And if you want more specific examples, I've made a couple of sample jobs for you to calculate later on. Okay, more questions you need to ask and answer. How do you make the correct job calculation? Where do you get all the numbers? Engineering is about numbers. If you cannot quantify something, usually engineers are not too interested in discussing it to great lengths. What do you do with all those numbers? What engineering and planning skills do you need? Is this a simple job, short, quick? Is it a long, complicated job? How much experience do you personally need in order to plan and execute a job? How do you select the correct type and quantity of men and equipment? Is this a small job, simple job, medium size, large job, complicated job? How do you make sure and certain that your equipment is the correct size, has the needed capacity and reliability to complete the job safely and quickly? How do you decide what to include in each job task segment? Look at your WBS, remember. And when do you make a task segment larger or smaller? What is the best order of your tasks to complete the job, the total job, quicker and safely? What should you avoid in your planning and engineering? The voice of experience is invaluable here. What supporting utilities and services and labor and testing and inspection do you need in order to prove to the customer that you have done the job correctly and completely? So it comes down to this question. How do you make absolutely sure you've included everything and have not forgotten anything? Should you double and triple check anything? Or maybe everything? How can you deliver a perfect job? Is it possible? Well, the more jobs you do, the closer you will get to perfection. Comparison pricing. Airborne services, advanced topics. Calculate the costs of other methods that you might consider to do a cleaning job. It goes back to personnel costs, one shift a day, two shifts a day, how many men, how many engineers, how many people at each skill level, equipment, quantity of equipment, capacity of the equipment, volume, PSI, quantity of units that you need, the cost of doing the planning and engineering, the cost of research, the manpower hours, how much does it cost to write documents, attend meetings, Construct the bid, get all the approvals, deliver the bid. How much does it cost to make work plans? Do you have the right work plan? Do you have your segment design correct? Do you have the order of lows correct? Referring to airborne. Do you need uh, air, water, electricity, diesel, hot lunches, uh, disposal, blah, blah, blah? What do you need to support the work? So you have to ask yourself these questions and answer them. Why should you do comparison pricing? Is it necessary or not? And why? How do you compare methods? You make a price comparison plan. Do you know how to do this? Can you make a price comparison plan? Discuss your price comparison plan with your direct supervisor. Why is this a smart move? Can you recognize a good price comparison plan? Can you make a good price comparison plan? What is the minimum of things to include in a good Price comparison plan. How to compare pricing. Ask yourself these questions, and again, you must answer these questions. It's not enough just to ask. How would you compare the completing efficiency of air blowing to water flushing for a given job? Can either one or both methods always be used inter interchangeably? Okay, which one is quicker? Which one is better? Is the amount of cleaning the same for unit time period, or is one method quicker than the other? Which method is better, and why? How do you compare the cleaning results? What is clean? How do you define it? How does your client define it? How do you measure it? If you don't define clean in the same way your client defines clean, there's going to be a problem when you present your invoice. I can tell you that right now. There will be a problem. How do you make sure that everybody agrees, agrees on the definition of clean? Clean in quotes. Quote, clean, unquote. How do you know when a method has failed? 
How do you quantify the results? What percent clean did you achieve? How can you calculate the amount of cleaning per cost unit per each method? Can you compare methods directly? Is this like comparing apples and oranges? So, your question is how to pick the best method for any given problem. How do you justify your choice of the best cleaning method for the job? You will have to justify this to your boss, to the supervisors, and probably to the client. So think about this before you get in that situation. How do you make sure you get paid for your efforts on any job method selected and completed? This is very important to your boss and his boss. The higher you go, the more important it gets. The higher in the organizational level. How do you feel about giving a guarantee of cleaning results when you bid on a job? Can you predict any problems with guarantees? Are you comfortable in guaranteeing your future action? Have you had to give cleaning result guarantees before? If you ever heard of no cure, no pay, how do you like that when there's no cure? What do you do to fix a cleaning failure? How do you correct a failure? And the most important question here, who pays the bill in case of fixing a failure? You don't want it to be you. Okay, a reminder again on your problem job analysis. Think of a problem job you had in the past or one you're working on now. Share the important details with me. What is the mechanical completion date? MCD is mechanical completion date. Describe and give all the details so the problem can be understood by me and a solution can be given to you. Give your ideas on the best way to correct the problem. Describe any choices of methods that would work to give suitable cleaning results. Defend your best choice for a good solution to this problem. Send your analysis and description of, quote, your job problem, unquote, to me by an email. And I will respond and advise you if I agree or if I can suggest other options. And if I need more info, I'll ask you for it. So think about your problem and my advice and see if you would or could change the job method. And tell me if you would pass my advice on to others in your team. Maybe they've had a similar problem. All right, a couple of sample job problems. The first one, I've just assumed we have a piping system that contains 17 cubic meters of volume. I'm not going to tell you how many personnel you need. Normally on air blows, you only work day shifts, sometimes night shift if you, if you have good lighting. So you'll have to design a team how much staff on your shift and how many teams per shift? You assume that. Tell me what your planning and engineering costs are. I suggest maybe two days times four people or four days for two people or you pick another number just so you tell me. And let's say your equipment costs are $300 an hour, but you must add delivery and removal charges, MOB and DMOB, to the $300 an hour. So estimate the cost of any risk of unknowns on the job, anything that would cost you extra time or mean a cost overrun. Don't forget to add the mob demob cost, add the cost of overrun risk to the job cost, and sometimes you have unknown risks. And then just so we'll all be consistent, use a 1.5 markup factor for the total bid selling price. So Calculate the job costs and give a total bid price. Give a cost amount for each breakdown point in the, in the slide. So total up your total bid price, total up your cost, calculate your total profit. After you complete the, next, complete the next training package, I will answer this question, is it cheaper to water flush or to air blow? The next, I'm sorry, just the next sample job problem in this training package. Now, your client's going to ask you, which method will give cleaner results? Which method would you choose and why? You have to defend your choice to your client. How could you complete the job any quicker? The client will always ask you that question. How much would the extra cost be for the quicker job? Would your client agree to pay for any extra costs in order to save time? Maybe if you double the quantity of air compressors or the quantity of men or you uh, have a bigger pipe fitting crew to separate the 
the total job into segments, maybe that would make it quicker. But you have to balance that against the extra cost for the extra men or services. Okay, definition. Costs times markup equals sale price. Profits equals sale price minus cost. And percent profit equals a profit divided by the sale price times 100. So for a markup of 1.5, your profit level is 33.333 ad infinitum percent. So we'd like to see what your percent profit would be on this job. All right, let's look at job, sample job number two. Compare the cost of air blowing versus water flushing. Let's work on the same 17 cubic meter piece of uh, plant system with some equipment, some piping, some other, other details, but keep them the same for both of these jo sample job problems. This sample problem in slide 20 has additional information that might help you to compare cleaning methods more easily and logically. Now, you might not have all of these when you thought about job problem, sample job problem number one. So make these calculations here in, on the slide on page 20 and see if you can justify your choice now for the best method, air blowing versus water flushing. Now, you may have to provide some costs from your own experience. These vary from location to location, and if so, just please describe and justify these costs and show how this affected your calculation. Make a brief summary and describe and justify the logic for your choice of cleaning method. Air blowing versus water flushing. Okay, why so many questions in these training slides, you may ask. My answer. One can teach and share knowledge either by lecture or by asking questions. Which one do you prefer? Sometimes a long lecture puts one to sleep. Some questions keep you awake all night. Which one do you use? Ask Socrates. You can Google Socrates. S-O-C-R-A-T-E-S, -E Socrates. A Greek person who is a very smart man. Okay, we are finished. We've come to the end. Thank you very much for your interest, for your participation in this first instructional package from VCG on modern commissioning equipment cleaning services. And I invite you, please check into our other services provided by VCG. I hope you have learned something new here, and I hope that you have will take away with you some skills and knowledge that will benefit you personally in the very near future. Please contact me if I can be of service to you in the future. There's my email, and I give you my best regards. This is Jim Vinson turning you off.